himself. Okay, great. Good afternoon, my name is Farid Abdunur. It's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the political science department and this course, which are organizing this event. So, this event is meant to draw on the rich resources that the department and this core have for reflecting on uh, global affairs and specifically on the specific conflict that's going on in Ukraine. It's, uh, we organized this as a teaching. There's going to be five speakers, and they will offer different perspectives, different approaches to thinking about the Russian war on Ukraine. I will introduce the speakers in a minute, but just wanted to give you a sense of the structure. Because one of our speakers is zooming in from Ukraine, uh, we want to be respectful of his time and the 10 hour time difference. Uh, it is now 11 o'clock for him. So he will go first. He will also take questions first. After he's done, we will then proceed in alphabetical order with the, uh, with the other speakers. They will all speak in order and then we'll have question and answer to the, for the other four speakers at the end. Okay? Um, so our first speaker is Professor Volodymyr Dubovic. He is Professor of International Relations of Odessa Mekhinov National University in Ukraine. Mechnikov, you see, I was trying to ask him about the pronunciation, but he was busy. Mechnikov National University in Ukraine. And we are very honored to have him. He will be speaking first. After that, uh, Professor Mikhail Alexeyev, some of you may know him, Professor of Political Science at ISCOR, uh, will, will then proceed. Then Professor Jonathan Grobart, Professor of Political Science and the advisor of ISCOR. Then Professor Emanuele Saccarelli, Professor of Political Science. Last but definitely not least, Professor Lata Barajan, who is Professor of Political Science and Director of ISCOR. So please just join me in welcoming our guest, Professor Rosalind. Many thanks uh, to Professor for having me, and I hope that you can hear me loud and clear. Yes, and uh, it's my pleasure to be part of this panel today. Uh, and I apologize again for not being able to confirm uh, to, the, to, the, to, to, to the format of your panel. Uh, indeed, uh, it not only is late here in Ukraine, I had a long day, uh, but also we are in the middle of a second, within a short period of time, uh, a great uh, period in the world. Uh, it's on right now, the sirens are on, and also I'm past my curfew time, but I mean, uh, where I am at, they're not that picky, peculiar, particular about, uh, uh, you know, in front enforcing, and people like myself not uh, giving talks in the middle of a curfew. <clears throat> yes, the situation is uh, definitely hard here in Ukraine. Uh, the war that we have on our hands, the Russian aggression against the train, is something which is uh, deeply troubling, and it's a major threat uh, for us here, uh, Ukrainians, Ukrainian state. Not only it's a threat to certain parts of Ukraine, but it's definitely an existential threat uh, to the entire nation of Ukraine, the nation state of Ukraine. Uh, many things that have uh, been uh, uttered in Moscow in the previous months and years, and ever since the start of this massive invasion on February 24th, uh, tell us uh, that uh, the maximum goal for Mr. Putin and his inner, click, inner uh, circle, his clique, yes, his inner circle, uh, is to actually do away with the Ukrainian state. Uh, we'll see if he is successful in doing that because actually there have been many setbacks in his military plans with the Ukraine ever since February 24th. And it seems that uh, he overestimated his uh, capabilities and underestimated Ukrainian capabilities. So that's good. Uh, that being said, the war is raging, and there's a new phase of war, a new stage of war uh, that just does start a couple of days ago in Donbass. Donbass is a far away, far east uh, region in Ukraine, which was actually in the middle of fighting for almost eight years, ever since 2014, because it was in 2014 that Russia has started this aggression against Ukraine, first by taking away the Crimean Peninsula, uh, you know, attempt occupying it de facto and attempting its annexation and then instigating and fighting the war in Donbass. Uh, that was a more of a low intensity conflict for most of the time, but uh, ever since February 24th, of course, Russia is you know, moving in, uh, in a massive invasion, multi-pronged, multi-dimensional, using a lot of forces, 
And what is uh, even more disturbing, they are using most of this force on civilians, actually. Uh, because actually, it's been very little prior to this uh, new uh, offensive in Donbass that they are you know, mounting right now. Uh, there have been very little combat on combat uh, uh, situations here in Ukraine. Uh, mostly Ukrainian uh, mobile and job units uh, hitting uh, Russian big convoys here in Ukraine. But no, you know, you know force on force kind of front, uh, front attacks and stuff like that. Uh, but unfortunately, at the same time, uh, Russians are shelling and bombing and um, sending missiles against civilian targets here in Ukraine. The, 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 the uh, purpose is clear, they want to inflict the maximum pain on Ukraine, they want to break the will for, of Ukrainians to, to fight. Uh, they're not succeeding so far, I mean, of course, it depends on who you talk here in Ukraine. If you talk to someone who's in Mariupol and who's sitting in his shelter for weeks now, without some basic food or water supply, of course, and under constant bombardment, they would probably be fine with any kind of peace deal, just to stop this torture, this suffering. But if you talk about the rest of Ukraine, uh, there is no appetite here whatsoever for any sort of surrender or capitulation. Uh, moreover, on the contrary, here in Ukraine, the fighting spirit is high right now, even though the losses are also high. Uh, that's a mood in the country which is reflecting uh, on uh, the major feeling that we're having, which is fear, which is, uh, which is anger. I was going to say that we also feel fear, we also feel terror, we also feel fear pain, and feel pain, but also most most primarily, most dominating, prevailing feeling here and emotion is anger. Because we don't think we have deserved this, we don't think we have deserved this brutality, and that's why most Ukrainians are don't, not thinking about uh, seeking uh, some kind of uh, concessions or offering some concessions to Russia. A couple of weeks ago, there was a round of negotiations in Istanbul, uh, you know, kind of mediated by Turkey, by President Erdogan, uh, and there were some suggestions on both sides, uh, you know, Muslim, Kiev, Russia, and Ukraine, uh, but they didn't go far. And frankly, ever since that time, uh, we've seen that uh, Russia is not uh, negotiating in, uh, in all honesty and sincerity. And also Ukraine has changed, negotiation positions for Ukraine has changed, because uh, since that time, the Russian offensive near the capital city of Kiev has uh, failed dramatically. They had to retreat and withdraw their forces. And also many uh, examples of Russian atrocities here in Ukraine and war crimes here. Uh, near Kiev and Chernihiv, uh, when they withdraw the forces, uh, withdrew their forces, there were many atrocities being revealed and found out, and that changed the, the public attitude here in the country even for the worse in terms of a, a future negotiations or peace deal. Right now, uh, there is no there is no attitude, there is no attitude here in Ukraine which would welcome these negotiations. So I'm afraid, therefore, since Moscow is willing to fight some more time and then Ukraine is not willing to surrender, we are in for more fighting. And that's what is going to happen. Uh, and it's going to be a different war. It's going to be more of a, of a big army and big army here in Donbass. And uh, it's going to be more of a, of a need for tanks and long-range artillery and stuff like that. And that's why the assistance that we're receiving now from our partners abroad is changing as well from uh, you know, mobile and light anti-tank weapons, for instance, that we needed in the first weeks of the war. Now we are in need of more heavier, heavier weapons like uh, armored carriers, tanks, uh, long-range artillery, and stuff like that. Uh, of course, the war itself, the military side of it, is not the only uh, you know, challenge for us here in Ukraine, and only threat for us here in Ukraine. We also have this humanitarian situation, which I mentioned to you, because you have uh, big cities, uh, civilian uh, centers, uh, shelled uh, intensely, intensively by Russia. And that includes the second largest city of Kharkiv. And previously to that, actually, Kiev, the uh, capital city, was also shelled on a number of occasions. Uh, the city of Mariupol, I mentioned again, uh, is a big city. It used to be 500,000 uh, people there. It's now probably uh, about a little, about 100,000 people, which is still there. Uh, so it's a humanitarian disaster there, obviously. But many other cities in Ukraine, and actually in the south and the east of Ukraine, which is interesting, you should think about it in a way that that's exactly where you had a certain segment of population which harbored some pro-Russian sentiments here in Ukraine. Um, but that is well done. 
No, you know, and that, tur that page is turned. I mean, there's, you, 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 would, you, would, you would be uh, hard pressed to find someone who still has pro Russian sentiments here in Ukraine. It is telling us something about the future of this conflict and also the future of Ukraine Russian relations after this war is over and some, someday it will be over and uh, we'll still be neighbors. But uh, there will be no, nothing on the Ukrainian side but the hatred for the Russians, I'm afraid to say. So we'll see how that develop, develops. How that evolves, but for now, yes, you actually have a lot of people who thought that probably you can have uh, friendly relations with Russia, but those people are exactly those who sat in those shelters, uh, bomb, sh bomb, bomb shelters for weeks uh, under Russian bombs, so therefore they're not going to come out of those shelters with any friendly feelings for Russia. Uh, that being said, also there is a huge economy toll. Obviously, and there is a lot of destruction here for Ukraine. Ukraine is not a rich country to start with. It's one of the poorer nations, actually, in, in Europe. Uh, not very well developed. Uh, been actually showing some uh, development, uh, you know, figures which were positive in many ways, but uh, still not very rich, as I said. And uh, the destruction that we are receiving here in Ukraine is going to have a major fall on Ukraine for the years or decades to come. There is so much destruction. I mean, it's infrastructure, uh, it's, uh, it's what have you, it's plants, it's factories, it's mines, it's agricultural land, for which Ukraine is actually famous uh, historically being a breadbasket for Europe. Even now, uh, there is a lot of uh, food uh, projects, uh, products rather, uh, sitting in Ukrainian ports, but being unable to leave Ukraine. Because Russia, among other things, is blockading Ukrainian uh, Black Sea ports. You know, and that's uh, something which is have also happened. And so there are many facets uh, to conclude my short presentation before we break for Q&A. Uh, there are many faces of this war. Uh, it's a war on military, it's a war on population, it's a war on Ukrainian economy, it's a war on Ukrainian future, so to speak. The major idea is to weaken Ukraine. It's to weaken Ukraine to beyond the point uh, where Ukrainians will be able to sustain as a nation, uh, next door to Russia is an independent nation, is a nation capable of uh, securing its territorial uh, integrity and sovereignty. And that's where we are right now. And I'm afraid it's not, uh, it's a bleak, it's gloomy, you know, so it doesn't offer any rosy scenarios for the immediate future. But that's where we are now in Ukraine. And I'm ready for your questions, so thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Dubulik. If you have questions or comments um, to Professor Dubovic, this is the time to ask him. As I said, he will not be with us for the, for the question-answer period that comes at the end. Please, go ahead. Uh, speak loudly. Thank you for presenting to us. Um, how, do you, how do you think that public opinion towards President Zelensky has changed since the war started? And what do you think the public opinion yeah. Yeah, I heard the question. Thank you. Well, the Lansky phenomenon is something, of course, that attracts attention really, yeah. and for a good reason. Uh, he was uh, kind of a divisive politician before the war. His rankings were kind of low, and he was looking uh, uh, drastically for ways to increase his ratings, and then the war came in. And all of a sudden, uh, he is really popular with a lot of people who didn't like him too much before the war, because He's making the right moves, he's staying in Kiev, he's not willing to leave, you know, he's showing the signs of courage and resilience, and he's staying close to the people, and people staying close to him. It's a unique situation for Ukraine, because we're often critical of our government, but in our 30 plus years of uh, modern history, of our state since independence in 1991, uh, we never had such a closeness and proximity between the people and population on one hand and the government and the president on the other hand. Uh, he's a wartime leader, we support him, he, he feeds on that support that he's seeing from, from, from the rest of the country. And that's what he's doing, and uh, he refused to leave Kiev when he was in real danger, and Russian troops were within miles from, away from the capital city. You know, he got famous for this uh, famous reply to American offers to evacuate him. He said, I don't need a right, I need an ambition. And that's uh, how his views has been on me remembered. It's not to say that he didn't make any mistakes before the war. He did make some, including not healing properly for the warnings coming from our American friends about Russia preparing for invasion, for instance, and not getting ready uh, in, in the right time uh, for the invasion. 
from a full scale regulation, he somehow down downplayed the threat. He explained that he doesn't want to scare the Ukrainian economy and doesn't want to terrorize the Ukrainian population prematurely, but uh, that was probably a mistake. Uh, yeah, since Russia was preparing for invasion, we were uh, in position to prepare better for our defense. But ever since the war started, he's making right noises and right statements. He's uh, talking to the public in a short, pointed, targeted sort of statements every day. He's talking to the public outside of Ukraine. He's a major lobbyist now for Ukraine. When he asks for some support and weapons being provided, it's very difficult for many Western politicians, not just Western politicians, he talks to everyone, he talks to Australia, to Japan, to Korea, uh, to, to refuse, you know, because he is a leader of the country in need, country which has been attacked without any reason, unprovoked, premeditated, massive invasion. And he is, uh, he is making the uh, most use out of it. And I think, uh, you know, that may change over time, but for right now, he's riding high. Uh, you know, I would rather not him, not having him in this position, <laughs> because the war may be riding high, but like, that's what's happening right now. saying that I'm really grateful here for the support coming to Ukraine in this time of need. And the Czech Republic of Czechia, as it's officially known right now, uh, these days uh, is one of those uh, who are supporting us uh, the most. Actually, we are being now uh, uh, very positively uh, kind of uh, affected and uh, took this uh, note of uh, Czech position uh, in a very positive way. Uh, Czech Republic is one of those countries which is sending most weapons, actually, and also hosting uh, a lot of uh, refugees, as you said. Yes, that's right. Uh, the men are between the ages of 18 and 60, me included, are not allowed to leave because we have a martial law. Uh, it actually means that not everyone can be drafted, like people for myself, for, them, for instance, the university professors were exempt from being drafted or mobilized, at least at this stage of uh, mobilization campaign. Uh, but at the same time, we're not allowed to leave. So that's a difficult situation for many people. Uh, you know, uh, not necessarily myself personally. I don't have family like wife and children, but many people like myself do. Uh, and that's a problem because it means we have a lot of divided families, millions of divided families, where wife and, and children will go abroad and uh, men will stay here. And that's hard uh, to, you know, to, to, to sustain, to go through all of this. And of course, people go abroad, and some people have never been abroad, and some people don't feel comfortable, even though they are being treated really well across Europe. Uh, actually, you know, Ukrainian refugees, uh, they don't complain. I mean, the people go above and beyond in various countries in Europe in helping Ukrainian refugees. But still, it's not their native land, they don't know the language, and uh, the, 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 those countries are overcrowded. For instance, Poland is really is very managing this uh, flow of Ukrainian refugees. Some countries are in similar situation. Poland was worst uh, affected in this respect. Uh, but uh, so that's what it is. But also you have IDPs, internally displaced persons, which is higher, even higher number here in Ukraine, in Western Ukraine. Uh, people left uh, the war-torn areas, uh, the, the areas where they are bombed and shelled, and they are here as you know, much bigger numbers. So if, if, if it is probably around 5 million now, and uh, then the IDP is probably something like eight, nine at least. So it's, we're talking about at least one third population of Ukraine, which has been 
uprooted drastically uh, and quickly and suddenly. It's a major exhaust. I mean, we didn't see anything like this uh, for decades because, of course, we've been major uh, flows of refugees in various parts of the world in recent uh, years and decades, but not in such a massive number, in much, not in such a very quick kind of a window of time uh, as here in Ukraine. But the totality of the war, you know, the, it's a total war. You know, it's a war where you have everything from tanks to missiles, from airplanes, bombing. They're now using strategic bombers as well. Uh, so they can actually reach out to their missiles any corner of the country. So it's not surprising that people are flowing away from, at least from battleground uh, areas. But the war travels with them. There was one example the other day, two days ago, in the Lviv, the western part of the country, there was a little boy, three, three years old boy, who got injured uh, by a missile coming into Lviv. And that boy was evacuated from Kharkiv, escaping with his family from bombing in that city in eastern Ukraine. And he traveled many hundred miles to western Ukraine, and Russian missiles still got to him in, in Lviv. Fortunately, his injuries are not severe, but still, the fact that he, the war found him there is something else. And the second question, again, uh, can you remind me the totality of war? It has to do with, you know, will, would Russia be tempted to do something? Yes, yeah, right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'll try to be brief. Uh, there, is a, there is a fear that it might. Uh, nothing can be outruled uh, you know, or discarded. This eventuality, because uh, Russia has proved again and again in the last almost two months that uh, they can do things that hardly been expected from them. Uh, you know, so yes, if something goes wrong for them, if they continue to incur major losses, as you said in your question, they might think about weapons of mass destruction, be it chemical, biological, or even nuclear. Uh, the focus is on chemical mostly, uh, but then, of course, the tactical nuclear weapon could be used as well. I don't think they're going to use it uh, anytime soon. Uh, they're still kind of confident that probably their offensive in the bus is going to work. But if it's not going to work, they will use it. If, 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 if they're going to be on the if or a threshold of actually uh, facing a defeat in Ukraine, or not to mention that maybe they'll be retreating from Ukraine and then Ukrainian forces might be actually counter-offensive uh, counter and getting closer to Russian borders, then they'll be tempted, they'll, they'll be tempted actually to use uh, weapons of mass destruction. Besides, the Russian propaganda has it that they're not fighting in Ukraine, they're fighting uh, the military operation, uh, limited military operation, you know, and uh, fighting against NATO and the US, not against Ukraine. So, uh, in many ways, it's been portrayed already in Russia that uh, this war is not against Ukrainians as such, but a bigger war against the West. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dubovic. Yes. And we really and I apologize for not being able to stay longer. Thank you. We really do appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Oh, I think you already left. Okay. So now Professor Mikhail Alexeyev will speak for 10 minutes. Okay. I request that and while I put in my PowerPoint, you don't count. It's all right. Because I need to disconnect this microphone. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you tell me when to count. Yeah, yeah. it will be quick. I just, I just need to uh, get this thing going. And I hope that it doesn't require me to uh, log in again, as it now does all the time. So I think that will be good. States, I lived 27 years. In the Soviet Union, I counted that exactly half of it, 13 and a half years, I lived in Russia and half in Ukraine. I was born in Ukraine. I 
you know, lived a long time in Russia, went to secondary school there. After coming to the United States and getting my PhD, I did a lot of research and field work, about 10, 13 years in Russia, and about eight years in Ukraine. So ask me about the, the region, use me as a cow, cows like to be milked. So uh, I will give you, uh, this is my subtitle. So there are four things I'm going to talk about. The characteristic of the conflict, what it is not also, and then the stakes and maybe a few things we can do uh, to uh, help the situation. So in March of 2021, we saw a massive buildup of Russian forces uh, around the borders with Ukraine. And you heard already that the conflict was going on since 2014. But this was an unprecedented scale. You know, you suddenly have 190,000 troops uh, Ukraine did nothing uh, extraordinary uh, to uh, warrant any, any kind of, uh, uh, you know, dislocation like that. It was disguised as exercises, and we see hundreds of equipped pieces of equipment, our personal carriers, tanks, troops amassed around the Ukraine border. We'll see the positioning of dozens of ballistic missile launchers and other devastating uh, military hardware all around. Uh, the borders of Ukraine, and then on February 24th, in the wee hours of the morning, massive strikes hit cities all over Ukraine. Here you see the uh, residential building being hit not far from the place in Kiev where I was delivered when I was born. And so, you know, it, it, it definitely hits home. You see massive destruction. Uh, that's the shopping mall, one of the big shopping malls in Kiev. Uh, countless casualties, we still don't know the extent of human loss in this conflict. We've moved on to the city of Kharkiv, the second largest city, where you see uh, these, uh, the, the center, the central square uh, being destroyed. Uh, Mariupol that Volodya mentioned, uh, and uh, that maternity hospital that was hit. Russia since then targeted a hundred other hospitals, and in fact Russia admitted that it targeted its hospitals. When Ukraine protested, the Russian spokesman said, well, we just targeted it because you guys are hiding the military personnel there. So uh, this is this woman who was pregnant, and now she actually died, um, uh, as, as um, unfortunately happened the result. But here you see also the, the theater in Mariupol with the word children written down on the pavement, and again, um, a, a, a direct hit uh, destroying uh, the theater with uh, multiple casualties. Mariupol was a beautiful city. Uh, I conducted some focus groups there and interviews in 2017. You can see some leafy streets there with blooming chestnut trees. That's what it looks now. It almost looks like a black and white photo. I'm glad there is one building that still has some color on it. It's actually a color photo. Uh, but it looks kind of like that. It looks like Guernica. It looks like Aleppo after Russian bombardments. It looks like Grozny uh, after Russian bombardments and, and other cities. But uh, here is also, I have a, my best friend's family in, in Mariupol. And uh, um, they were telling my friend that, you know, uh, we're here. Uh, and, and the connection was broken. They couldn't hear from them for two weeks. They were worried what was going on. We have corpses lying in the streets, decomposing. It's, it's, it's absolutely uh, horrible. And we have seen those uh, uh, in, in the streets of Kiev, which you see on the left-hand side. And Mariupol, when they had a chance, they would go and they would pick up those bodies, put them in body bags, and put them in trenches, because there is nothing else they can do. So we still have basically mass graves there. The mayor of Mariupol basically called this whole big city one huge gas chamber. Uh, that, uh, with the analogy uh, to what the Nazis did in World War II. And we know also what happened in cities that came under Russian occupation. Uh, we see bodies here documented with satellite photos that Ukrainian military and international journalists discovered when they moved in. A lot of summary executions with people, their hands tied behind their backs. And that photo, uh, just look in the eye, that person didn't close his eyes before he died and he's in the body bag and I think this is one of those photos that makes you wonder about where are we as, as humanity. Now Biden called it genocide, he didn't call it right away as genocide, but I think the timing of the call is actually appropriate because 
Uh, it was then that Russia, in addition to the military uh, bombardments of civilians, stepped up the propaganda campaign, saying that the new goal of the campaign is de-Ukrainianization. And Ukraine does not deserve the right to exist as a nation. In other words, the goal of the operation is to get rid of Ukraine, erase Ukraine and its people and its culture from the face of the earth. Now, Ukrainians, we have heard tremendous resilience. President Zelensky, one big meme is the uh, uh, defiant resistance to the Russian warship that tried to seize an island of Ukraine, saying uh, when the Russian warship announced itself, the Ukrainian young soldier said, Russian warship, go fuck yourself. And now you can see it everywhere uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, it's a society that resists. Somebody called Ukraine a nation of artists and warriors. Uh, this is a scene from the revolution in 2014 in Maidan, the person playing the piano in front of the right. We see people trying to stop tanks with their bare hands. Uh, a rock musician in the trenches composes a song, Pink Floyd picks it up. Uh, hey, hey, rise up, their first song in 30 years. My surveys that I conducted with my colleagues in Ukraine actually show that Ukrainians wanted to negotiate, but their preferred method of resolving this conflict was negotiation, uh, overwhelming support for negotiation. They were stunned. But my also data suggests why they fight. Uh, the things that correlate with the will to fight are perception that democracy is important and that Russia is the aggressor in the conflict. And so you have that kind of what I call the iron triangle of will uh, to fight uh, for, uh, for Ukraine. It will be indeed, as Volodya said, hard to negotiate. This is from one of my focus groups after the war in Donbass was grinding on for years. A woman is saying, actually it would be horrendous uh, if we uh, negotiated some kind of peace because the, what would that mean for all the lives being lost? So, um, it's the anti-colonial war for political freedom, uh, started with Maidan, and it's basically the Ukrainian revolution and, and attempts to democracy versus uh, Putin's consolidated authoritarian regime with torture uh, and uh, lack of... And, and Putin actually responded to these democratic changes in Ukraine in 2014 with massive movements on troops, annexation of Crimea, Donbass, you see the trench warfare. What is it not? Well, there are three pillars of Russian disinformation that they try to kind of obfuscate the conflict, distract attention. One is outright lies. I'm not even going to discuss it. There is simply no evidence for that. Um, and uh, um, the other one is false causality. Uh, Russia claiming, as Volodya said, that they're fighting NATO. Well, NATO membership is voluntary. It's, it's not a, an empire. They're not forcing people to join like Russia does. Russia is a nuclear superpower, which makes military threat far less credible. U.S. forces in Europe declined, actually, since 1991. No troops were stationed in the former Soviet Union until the Crimea annexation, and still zero tanks in the Baltics. No nukes in Eastern Europe, keeping the promise of Gorbachev. NATO-Russia Council was set up. Russia didn't want to use it very much. And Turkey, the largest military power, actually buys weapons from Russia. So if anything, what we see, look at that decline in the number of US troops in Europe. And, 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 and so, as my friend in Kiev put it, NATO grew, but it has no balls. And as far as Ukraine and Russia, look at the difference in firepower. So clearly, the kind of couple of hundred uh, Javelin missiles that were provided to Ukraine between 2014 uh, and 21 are not quite enough. What really is a problem for Putin with NATO expansion is not the military infrastructure, but democracy. And here you can see the democratization. The appearance of Ukraine as a successful democracy would be basically a death blow to Putin's kleptocratic dictation. Um, now, there is false equivalence. Uh, we can discuss that later. That yes, uh, you can pick some images when we did horrible things, reprehensible things in other conflicts, like for example in our invasion in Iraq. Uh, but here are some of the things that we don't do that Russia is doing that make it qualitatively different. And uh, uh, we don't use these, for instance, horrific weapons anymore. So what's at stake? Why Ukraine must win? Well, think of what happens if Russia wins. Colonialism wins, dictatorship wins, male chauvinism, white supremacy wins, xenophobia wins. If Russia wins, who loses? Human life is lost, peace loses. The right to self-determination, territorial integrity, democracy, LGBTQ, cultural identity. What can we do? 
Well, a couple of things, just, just I'll wrap up in 30 seconds. So one is think of Ukraine. There are different things we can do. Visit the house of Ukraine, make a friend. They now say in Ukraine, if you say how are you, it's equivalent to saying I love you. Just to find out how somebody is. There is fantastic there are fantastic resources. Uh, there are elected officials, and the House of Ukraine website also has the donations if you're interested to do that. You can also create your own things. But ultimately, this is my final big message. We can make our own democracy better. We can make our own state better. We have huge problems right now. Ukraine is fighting for freedom, and yet in many states in the United States, we're restricting the right to vote. Uh, and a lot of that is based on, say, racial or economic considerations. We have racial justice problems, we have social justice problems, we have a problem with trust in institutions. Remember what Dinner saying, how they are now trust their institutions. They, we can maybe learn something from them even. So we, we have a lot to improve. We can challenge false narratives. It's a, it's a fight worth fighting. Thank you guys very much. Our next speaker is Professor Jonathan Grobart, who many of you know, I think. I thought, yes. Hi, I'm going to take my mask off just for this. Uh, so, you know, I join everyone here in condemning Russia's uh, invasion and war crimes and express uh, my support for all the people in Ukraine, including non Ukrainian nationals. My focus today, however, is to think about the situation from the perspective of a U.S. citizen. It's a vital issue given how long there's been U.S. involvement in this conflict and significant fears of a direct U.S.-Russian altercation. I'll start with at home uh, with a response from SDSU's president and the dean of my college. Both publicly condemned the invasion, with our dean even calling for faculty to support students who may wish to join the resistance. I've been here 20 years. I've never seen the leadership condemn any other invasion and atrocities, such as the U.S. invasion of Iraq, Saudi Arabia's invasion of Yemen, Israel's repeated offensives in the Gaza, nor have I seen calls to support students that want to join resistance, say, to the Israeli aggression. You might think, however, oh, good. SDSU is finally condemning an awful action. This will set off a new practice. Well, don't better it. Rather, the leadership is simply hopping on the bandwagon occupied by most of our media, most policy intellectuals, the foreign policy establishment in the United States. It's single out the atrocities of our enemies, stay silent, or excuse those committed by the U.S. or its close allies. So why is this selective condemnation a problem? Three reasons. One, we lack universal applicability. Then we fail to judge our own shortcomings. And third, most importantly, we further a long-standing U.S. foreign policy practice of politicizing moral indignation to legitimize aggressive U.S. interventionism and militarism. This is a practice that, over years, has had troubling consequences at home for civil liberties and disastrous consequences abroad, especially for those most vulnerable. So, just to combat the selective indignation, a brief history of a long and disturbing U.S. record, um, starting uh, with uh, the post-World War II record. So the U.S. during the Cold War era. In brief, it supported brutal regimes right from the beginning, in Greece, Central and South America, the Caribbean, uh, including Cuba up to 1959, across the Middle East, Pakistan, Zaire, Indonesia, could go on supported or sponsored coups that left an ugly trail of tears. Again, Greece, Iran, Guatemala, Chile, Indonesia, Vietnam. Sometimes they failed, like in Cuba, but not for lack of evidence. Uh, most famously was the full-scale invasion of Vietnam that extended to Cambodia and Laos. This ultimately led to several million kills, and this was the total demolition of villages. This was uh, saying was killing anything that moves, they dropped 70 million liters of toxic petroleum, like Agent Orange, and they did sponsor torture of prisoners. Those were the Tiger Games. All these actions during the Cold War were justified by scaring the hell out of the American people, easily bringing up the threat of the Soviets and of communism, and proclaiming our noble intentions. So we would use often the real human rights atrocities of our enemy, especially the Soviet Union, to justify our own aggressive militarism and accompanying war crimes. 
things didn't change dramatically after the fall of the Soviet Union, the Soviet bloc, by the end of the 1980s. We did maintain support for states engaged in aggression, illegal occupation, war crimes, think of Israel as kind of a central one. The United States has single-handedly protected, prevented any significant condemnation of Israel. Uh, looking at the, Irish, the sanctions regime against Iraq in the 1980s, granted they had a quote humanitarian exception for humanitarian needs of Iraqis, but the United States set a very demanding and unilateral standards that had devastating consequences on the civilian population. Two successive UN humanitarian coordinators, Dennis Halliday and Hans von Spohn, both resigned over protests over the deadly humanitarian impact of the sanctions. Going to the U.S. invasion of 2003 and subsequent occupation, this was certainly done in blatant violation of the U.N. Charter, and it had a deadly impact. The most respected uh, scholarly journal, The Lancet, its study in 2006, 601,000 Iraqi civilians killed in the first 39 months of the invasion. Given that the aggression continued, uh, it's likely surpassed a million over the next two years. Since 9-1-1 collectively, since 9-11, the United States has dropped over 300,000 bombs and missiles, mostly across the Great Middle East, but extending to parts of Africa. A notorious recent incident in the summer of 2017 had to do with the U.S. air war in Syria, particularly in Raqqa. The U.S. government called it the, quote, most precise air campaign in history, unquote, and the Pentagon certainly backed that up. But as Amnesty International and other outside observers found, it left Raqqa a destroyed city. Over 70% of the buildings were destroyed, at least several thousand civilians killed. And you know, this is a good time to ask, still, isn't US behavior less egregious than that of Russia? It's more of a yes or no. Yes, there is a formal legal process. There are lawyers advising on war crimes. But the new policy since the 1990s is to reinterpret the laws of war especially those that are called the rule of proportionality, comparing military value to civilian costs. Now, it's not just military targets that are fair game, but a wide scope of infrastructure targets, as well as political and communication targets. They do talk about breaking the will, breaking the will, degrading the enemy. And meanwhile, on the other, on the other side of the ledger, the assessment of the likely civilian costs is narrowly calculated. So they do gain it. For this reason, U.S. US Defense Intelligence Agency uh, officers told Newsweek that the first 24 days of the Russian bombing of the Ukraine caused less destruction than the first day of the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. So let's not get too smug about you know, what we wouldn't do. Finally, there is the long U.S. record of blatant disregard of international law constraints. 1986. They rejected the International Court of Justice ruling about um, mining the Nicaraguan harbors, supporting uh, the Contras attack and quote, soft targets, which meant killing of lots of civilians. The US joined Iran and Libya as the only states to have rejected an ICJ decision. In fact, the United States escalated its aggression against Nicaragua after the ruling. In 1999, the Special Yugoslavia Criminal Tribunal, the prosecutor, Carla Del Ponte, announced he would extend her investigation of war crimes to U.S. NATO actions in the, in the bombings of Kosovo. U.S. officials quickly made clear that that happens for shutting down the prosecution. You can read Del Ponte's memoirs. He decided we're going to back off. 1998, the United States is one of seven states that vote against the International Criminal Court Treaty. In 2002, the U.S. Congress overwhelmingly passes a law authorizing the United States to take, quote, all steps necessary, unquote, to liberate any official, U.S. official held under ICC custody. Outsiders dubbed this the HUD, the Hague Invasion Act. And then there's just a general refusal on the Pentagon to conduct independent investigations of U.S. military actions for war crimes. So there's reason to do this intense scrutiny um, because we do have to think what's being asked of the United States in response to undeniable atrocities elsewhere. And so just to kind of wrap up on implications, um, we certainly should condemn, and we all do condemn, uh, the Russian invasion and the corresponding war crimes. But it is crucial, and it's crucial for all the world to situate it in a broader context. Within the United States, 
is all the more urgent to scrutinize U.S. hypocrisy and the U.S. record of politicizing human rights violations of the enemy to justify its own militarism and aggression. So this recent altercation has been a boom to the Pentagon, to defense contractors, to uh, fossil fuel producers. Meanwhile, the cause of the climate crisis has been gravely affected. What we should do, we should insist on universal standards, universal applicability. So let's hold both Russia and U.S. and plenty of other countries to this scrutiny. We should certainly emphasize diplomacy, not military intervention. We shouldn't see support at this point for more military attacks. And you know, in terms of what we can do for the Ukrainians, think about solidarity from below. That is, there's people you know, within the US sphere of influence, within the Russian sphere of influence that are suffering mightily, and so a common cause for peace, for social justice, for anti-imperialism, and to not repeat the official enemy line of just citing the uh, crimes of the enemy. This was done in the 1980s. Uh, there was the European nuclear disarmament campaign, and this started with West European activists joined by Eastern European activists who were looking for some kind of common fronts. There's some elements of that now, but I, I think in terms of what we can do, in terms of thinking both about the Ukraine, but situating it more broadly, that solidarity from below is the way to go, not cheering on the Pentagon or the President. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Professor Emanuele Saccarelli. Again, I think many of you know him. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Uh, I think it's difficult to do any of this in two minutes, uh, but I think I, I was, was going to do a version of what my colleague Professor Grover did as far as reviewing some of the, the, the history of, uh, of American imperialism and the very real connection that that has to how we understand and how we intervene, if you like, in the present conflict. I think that it's of critical importance, not just as an academic, responsibility but really zoom out and understand the horrible events of the present in their proper historical context. I think nobody gains anything from narrowing the scope to the extent that all you see is that like uh, suddenly, inexplicably, some madman launches an invasion and there's bodies in the streets and therefore we must, we must, we must what? I mean the question of historical perspective is of uh, primary importance. And I think this is about big questions, which I can only touch on and identify for you. But I think this is, at a minimum, a call for you to really come to great grips with the fact that the political present is but a surface, which kind of it's come about as become the present as a result of the accumulation of a very tragic and really undigested past. And you have, as a young person, hoping to kind of live a decent life uh, in, uh, uh, in the future, you have to really uh, come to groups with that reality. One could start from very far back because we're dealing with all the questions of the 20th century that were thought to be surpassed are back with a vengeance, the question of imperialism, the question of war, and particularly the threat of uh, another world war. All these things that at a certain point in our history were kind of relegated to the archives by some are coming back with a vengeance and they're threatening and they're real sense your future as a young person. I'm going to emphasize in particular the significance of 1991, the collapse of the Soviet Union. I'm going to use that just to kind of touch on a, a few points. But um, those of you who weren't around then, I mean, the, the ideological climate at the time was a climate of enormous intoxication and enthusiasm. Uh, there were claims made about the end of history and the fact that from now on at last to the collapse of the evil empire, things are going to be set right in the world. Prosperity and all of that. The reality, here we are a few decades later, is absolutely nothing of the sort. Uh, the promises, the, the intoxicated delusions of this kind of end of history narrative, the collapse of the Soviet Union, far from marking an inflection point toward a kind of the long march of democracy toward all the good stuff was in fact quite a catastrophe if we were to be honest. And I say this not as a supporter of the old Stalinist regime, which I do not support, but certainly uh, the Soviet Union collapsing was a social catastrophe for the people in the region insofar as 
the economic and social conditions for many people in the area uh, um, declined and quite rapid, rapidly and drastically. But it was also, you might say, a political catastrophe. Because far from ushering in some sort of blooming garden of democracy in East Europe and the former Soviet Union, what has really happened, and what has happened in the past several decades, is that Russia, but also Ukraine, but also to name a few uh, East European states of note, based on what we've so far, Poland and Hungary, got exactly the kind of capitalism and the kind of called liberal democracy that they could have, which is uh, not at all. That is to say, the uh, what happened in 1991 was not kind of Russia in particular being uh, put placed back on the correct track of history to resume its place in the community of kind of aspiring liberal democracies, but it gave rise entirely predictably to a kleptocratic, horrible regime which is now decided to wage war against Ukraine. But it's not just Putin. And I must say that I, I, don't, I cannot accept the notion that Eastern Europe, Eastern Europe is somehow sort of headed toward the wonderful democratic reforms, but from it, the governments of Poland, the governments of Hungary, these are very, uh, how to put it, uh, alarming political entities which uh, have very deep-seated connections which with uh, uh, ultra-right and, and quite uh, uh, far-right uh, elements. And so the, the first thing I wanted to point out is that we, we should use this conflict as an opportunity to reflect seriously on the real history of the 20th century. Who, who, who was doing what? And what exactly is represented by, by the usual narratives? I think, in that sense, generally speaking, uh, Putin and his regime represent the most manifest and visible uh, uh, demonstration that this narrative about the end of history and the, the final collapse of the Soviet Union as a tremendous thing was, in fact, a lie. Then there's the issue of American imperialism which uh, I'm not going to say too much more than what uh, my colleague Professor Grover has said. But I must say that 1991, from that standpoint, marked. It's not that not, not much has changed since 1991. What has changed is that American imperialism has gone on quite a rampage, because it's in spite of the promises of uh, the end of history and the dividends of peace and all the stuff that the various administrations issue. What has been the reality is an uninterrupted series of bloody conflicts in which, not coincidentally, the American government has always been at the center. And in particular, those who now insist that it, the real problem is that we must do more, we being, of course, this abstraction called America, as if it existed, what they, what the notion that the American government should be more involved, I, I, I think is something similar to thinking that, you know, if we deputize Jack the Ripper, we can finally bring some peace and security in the streets of London. Uh, the record of American imperialism, particularly after 1991, is a bloody record, which Professor Grover has covered. I must say, too, that I've seen some tanks and planes on the screen, but if we, if, particularly after the conflict in Ukraine began, the, the, the Biden administration has set out to secure for American military expenses unprecedented numbers. It is a well-known fact, and I think it might have to be recalculated on the basis of these more recent facts, that the United States government spends more on what it calls euphemistically defense than the next 10 countries combined. And it is, if one were to kind of take through just, just the names, you know, the first World War, Somalia, Haiti, Bosnia, Kosovo, the invasion of Afghanistan, the invasion of Iraq, Libya, Syria. We are not dealing with a benevolent entity that's kind of stumbling its way and kind of incompetently not doing what it should. We are dealing with an entity that I think King in 67 rightly characterized as the single greatest purveyor of violence in the world. And that is as true today as it was in 1967. Um, There's another issue which I'd like to, to point out, which is the question of democracy, which has come up. And just to briefly make the point that, again, 
we were told, we, particularly my generation, that in 1991, sort of the collapse of the totalitarian regime of the Soviet Union was usher, gonna usher in a real boom in a revival of democracy. The truth is that the American government and many other governments that sort of like to characterize themselves as democracies are in immense and chronic and irresolvable political crisis. This is a country in which a year ago, as a result of a nearly successful American democracy almost went up in flames, and it was a very close call. This is a country in which you have the uh, plot carried out to kidnap and kill the governor of Michigan, and recently the people tried to carry out the terroristic act were acquitted. This is a country in which the police every year kill about an average of a thousand citizens in the streets. This is a country that's already at war with itself, and this is a country in which democratic norms and institutions are in the process of collapse. Biden, in a rare moment of lucidity, a few months ago, noted that he wondered if it was possible for American democracy to survive in the face of all this. I think the attack on voting rights has already been pointed out. And so, uh, if I were to really boil down, like what, what I want to tell you as young people here is that, like in the face of a massive pro-war, pro-involvement, pro-NATO propaganda, I'm, I'm astonished by the fact that, like, the, the the sort of coverage of these events that happens in like whether CNN or Fox or some other, sort of, which you are told are independent, independent of what. This is a corporate media that is pushing relentlessly you toward a war which we, as humanity, would not survive. And at the end of the day, if you want to really boil it down, I think that you should place absolutely no trust, not only in Putin's corrupt and criminal government, which I certainly agree with, but all the other many corrupt and criminal governments that do nothing but push, kind of move the needle closer and closer to a conflict of catastrophic implications that would destroy any prospect you might have for for a decent life in the future. Uh, I'm going to stop there, uh, and I thank you for your Next is Professor Lata Varadarajan, the Director of Histor and Professor of Political Science. Again, I'm sure you know her. Well, thank you all. I think that I really appreciate those of you who have taken time in the middle of a Wednesday afternoon and have been patient enough to stay here through all these presentations. So I will try to be very succinct and um, try to wrap this up. All right, so in August 2021, when he announced the end of US operation in Afghanistan, the US President Joe Biden announced, and I quote, we have been a nation too long at war. If you're 20 years old today, you have never known an America at peace. It's time to end the forever war. In March 2022, as he concluded his week-long tour of Europe that was meant to mobilize NATO support for Ukraine, Biden declared, we must commit now to be in this fight for the long haul. We must remain unified today and tomorrow and the day after and for the years and decades to come. This fight, Biden warned the American people, would have immense costs and would not be easy. But it was a necessary one for, and now I quote again, it was a great battle for freedom, a battle between democracy and autocracy, between liberty and oppression, between a rules-based order and one governed by brute force. Biden made this announcement while he was standing in Warsaw. Right next to him was his friend and constant companion, President Duda, whose PIS party in Poland, you might be aware, uh, has been condemned as being ultra-right, chauvinist, anti-Semitic, authoritarian. Uh, it has completely banned abortion as a form of family planning. It persecutes the LGBT community and criminalizes the exposure of Polish complicity in the Holocaust. But that irony was lost on the American president, and that's not even that important. What's perhaps important to remember is that his disavowal of forever war lasted nine months. The reason for that, as Biden pointed out, was that 
There's going to be a new world order out there, and we have got to lead it. So, what is this order, and how new is it? Ever since Putin launched his invasion of Ukraine, you'll notice that the message that has come out from Washington, various NATO capitals, and Western media outlets has been very cohesive. Agitation to do more, demands as to why the war has not been escalated, why no-fly zones have not been imposed, etc., etc. And as statements by various public figures, not just Joe Biden, have made it clear, for all these people, this war presents an opportunity to, if not actually carry out regime change in Russia, at least substantially weaken the current regime. The war in Ukraine is simultaneously a criminal war of aggression and part of a larger geopolitical battle between the US, NATO, and Russia. Leon Panetta, the former CIA director and defense secretary under Obama, admitted just a couple of weeks ago, we are engaged in a conflict here. It's proxy war with Russia, whether we say it is or not. This proxy war has been in the making for some time. My colleagues have already spoken about it. Ukraine, unfortunately, has become sort of a battlefront for this proxy war, uh, especially over the past eight years. It has seen uh, a stream of armed supply training from various US administration, as well as joint training exercises with NATO countries, including three last year alone, Operation Sea Breeze in the Baltic in June, a second drill involving US, Poland, and Lithuania in July, rapid trident in September 2021, right? Since 2014, the U.S. has used two programs, the Pentagon's Ukraine Assistance Security Assistance Initiative and the State Department's Foreign Ministry financing to channel nearly $5 billion in military aid to Ukraine. In its first year alone, the Biden administration sent $650 million of lethal aid. In, since February, since the invasion, the U.S. has committed a further $2.6 billion in military aid, the total for the Biden administration alone is around 3.2 billion and it's rising. Within a week of the invasion, NATO announced member states including Belgium, Canada, Czech Republic, Estonia, France, Germany, Greece, Latvia, Lithuania, the Netherlands, Poland, Portugal, Romania, Slovakia, Slovenia, and Britain began sending significant deliveries of military aid to Ukraine and the organization is committed to beefing up its eastern flank. The EU tapped funds from its off-budget European Peace Facility to immediately commit nearly 1.5 billion euros towards lethal military aid. In the past few months, the types of weapons that are being supplied to Ukraine include bullets, rifles, air defense systems like Sky Street from the UK and Stinger from the US, Javelin missiles, as well as longer range weapons like howitzers, anti-aircraft systems, anti-ship missiles, armed drones, armored trucks, personnel carriers, and even tanks. Uh, the German arms uh, giant Rheinmetall uh, has offered to refurbish and send up to 50 Leopard 2 main battle tanks to Ukraine, along with an offer to train Ukrainian tank crews. It's supposed to be a private corporation making this offer, not a government, uh, but anyway. Uh, so State Department officials, military advisors, pundits of all stripes have made it clear that this is going to be a protracted conflict, measured, and I quote, if not in decades, at least years, and that the supply of weapons has to be calibrated for a long, bloodletting war. These actions have been presented as the only way, the right way to show support for the Ukrainian people, a people who are very obviously suffering under an attack. Any questioning is quickly dismissed as pandering to Putin and even treasonous. But questioning these tactics is exactly what needs to be done today, which is why I appreciate both this panel and the fact that we are able to have this conversation. Right? To begin with, these very actors who have suddenly discovered deep pockets to help the Ukrainian people have actually been involved in systematic undermining and destruction of Ukrainian sovereignty over the past 30 years. Uh, as Professor Dubovic mentioned, Ukraine was not a wealthy country before even this war began. As measured by GDP per capita, Ukraine with its 44.13 million inhabitants is the poorest or the second poorest country in Europe. It competed with Moldova, a country with about 2.6 million people for this uh, dubious title. World Bank 
data already showed that the country's GDP declined by 56% compared to what it was when it was the Soviet Republic in 1989. <coughs> According to the World Inequality Database, the bottom 50% of Ukraine's population got just 22.6% of all the country's income and 5.7% of its wealth. The top 10% own nearly 60% of Ukraine's net personal assets. In 2018, Ukrainian households' net average savings stood at minus $245. Its industrial sector has shed over 1.4 million jobs in the last decade. The healthcare sector has been completely dismantled as a result for a demand for efficiency, to the point that when the pandemic broke out, President Zelensky declared Ukraine was medically naked. These are just a few facts that paint a very grim picture of what IMF and EU austerity measures had already wrought in Ukraine prior to this invasion. Right? But there's another reason to be wary about the escalation of weapons supply, and that's history. On Twitter, various op-eds in the weeks after uh, the invasion, US politicians and former government officials referred frequently to the possibility of making Ukraine Putin's Afghanistan. Uh, it indicated in many ways that people in Washington were quite happy with the idea of a protracted conflict as a life option. Uh, you could think about the brave resistance of the Ukrainian people and see, oh, that's what they mean by Afghanistan. But perhaps these tweets were more revealing than the former policymakers intended. You see, Soviet involvement in Afghanistan was actually carefully plotted by Spigner Brzezinski and the national security apparatus of the Carter administration. It is something Brzezinski has been very proud about. He has consistently spoken about it. Right? As Anatole Lee and, and others have pointed out in Afghanistan, USA actively favored the extremists with the official line being America was right to fund and arm Islamist radical groups rather than their moderate allies because, and I quote, they are the ones who killed the Russians. Of course, the fact that these groups would later on become the enemies de jour during the war on terror, leading a different US administration to invade Afghanistan under the aegis of yet another war on uh, yet another new world order in the 21st century. Now that's part of the horrific saga that doesn't make its way into these pithy comments using the Afghanistan analogy for Ukraine. What is also glossed over is the fact that the US involvement had very little to do with the interests of the Afghan people or the security and integrity of, of Afghanistan as a state. The history of Afghanistan over the past 30 years, and even right now, is a telling indictment of that policy. So, whose interest does a protracted war serve? The Biden administration has proposed a record-setting $813 billion national security budget. Germany and other European countries are publicly committing to buying and selling more weapons and spending more on defense. NATO is raising the prospect of expanding its permanent military presence in Europe. Washington is reasserting its political dominance over Europe on security matters. And some of the same people who cheered on the declaration of an open-ended war on terror are now writing with routine belligerence about the need for a new Cold War to aggressively defend the rules-based world order by taking the fight beyond Russia to North Korea, Venezuela, Iran, and about all to China. In that sense, and now I conclude, this declaration of a new world order promises to deliver exactly what the earlier declarations did, never-ending conflicts that benefits the few while ensuring misery and oppression for the majority of the world. Thank you. 
We see this in the U.S.'s armament of Ukraine and its continued defense of the Monroe Doctrine, and China's rearmament, and very obviously in the case of Russian invasion of Ukraine. All this leads me to two questions. First, what has uh, be clear. First, has NATO expansion made Europe more secure? And second, why have both 20th century power politics persisted into the 21st? Thank you. Yes, please go ahead. How do you guys think that the current conflict in Russia-Ukraine will affect the conflict in Bosnia in regards to Russia's close ties with the Serbs? So, I'm being asked to ask you to introduce yourself. Okay. You are free to do so if you want. <laughs> okay. So, um, I know when we ask, answer questions, we can refer by name rather than name. Okay. Uh, so, let's, let's see who wants to address these first two questions, and then we'll take the next couple of questions I see. Okay. So, there was a question about NATO expansion. Has it made Europe more secure? There was a second question there that I missed. Oh yeah, sure. Um, why have uh, supposedly uh, 20th century power politics that were uh, discarded uh, during the period of NATO expansion, supposedly, um, why have uh, power politics and real politics uh, considered or continued to be central to the security concerns of states in the 21st century? Thank you. So, does anybody want to address, engage any of the three questions that have been raised? Your question is huge. Uh, it's almost uh, will require kind of a, a review of international relations theory. Um, you mentioned something though. I mean, the the idea of uh, you know, if you look at the international relations theory, uh, the biggest debate is between you know various versions of realism and, and versions of liberalism. And ultimately, they boil down to the degree of anarchy in the international system. Uh, if uh, anarchy referring not to chaos, but to the um, presence of central authority above nation states. And the fundamental problem with the international system is that there is no central authority above the nation states. There is no 911 at the international level. And uh, so, uh, the uh, what any state may have to do will depend on other states. And as Ken Waltz, the one of the founders of uh, Neorealism wrote, it only takes one Hitler to change the plans of everybody else in the system and to uh, prompt actors to do things that they otherwise would not do. Uh, so uh, that is you know, one perception. The, the neoliberal argument, by the way, uh, Emmanuel mentioned the end of history article by Fukuyama, which seem to be the kind of the triumphant declaration of that, that with the defeat of fascism in World War II and the collapse of communism in 1991, basically only one alternative exists, and it's the Western-style liberal democracy, the democracy and free markets. And the institutions, the democratization, the uh, interdependence that this creates would mitigate uh, those uh, you know, vagaries of anarchy that led repeatedly to great power wars in the past. And, uh, and unfortunately, you know, uh, there are, of course, a lot of egregious things. I, I agree with many speakers that we basically blew the post-Cold War, you know, situation. We squandered the unipolar moment. Uh, but, but, you know, the question then arises, what do we do now? You know, do we, you know, allow basically things to go from bad to worse? or do we do something different to improve them? And, 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 and that's the big question. So what we see, for instance, the, the Russian-Ukraine war is an interesting test for this debate between realism and liberalism. Uh, because, yeah, because we had Russia amassing all these troops, right? Military power. And how did we counter it? Well, we threatened sanctions. Economic sanctions, cutting Russia off from the banking system, imposing sections on the oligarchs, etc., etc. Well, Russia still invaded. So for now, at least, <laughs> the debate is resolved that we are back to the old patterns uh, of the past in terms of international relations. 
Now, what Bosnia and Serbia, yes, I think this is one of the potential and, and underappreciated uh, negative fallouts of the current conflict because uh, the, the strategic plans of Moscow for a long time have been since Putin's arrival in power and consolidation of his autocracies, basically they don't want to see the European Union as an entity. Because then they deal with a democratic free market uh, actor of 300 million people. Whereas if they have individual states, they can, you know, uh, support right-wing parties, uh, corrupt politicians, you know, mess around, uh, get lucrative co contracts for properties, oil and gas sales, etc., etc. So, Serbia is a big linchpin in that. I mean, um, they, they, there have been efforts to destabilize uh, the former Yugoslavia and the Russian part for a while, and that's one of those things that it would, you know, uh, activate the great Serbian nationalism that, that would re revisit the peaceful arrangements uh, that existed since Dayton. Great. So uh, just to, to highlight something before other speakers uh, engage, we're going to try not to make the questions and the responses into many different right? <laughs> Well, we have a time limit. I mean, yeah, yeah. Give, us, give us the time I mean, limit, for it. Give, give us the time limit. I mean, for a minute, maximum that's two. Well, you know, it's the massive capacity, I apologize, the massive capacity of Slavs for conversation. <laughs> I apologize for that. <laughs> so, uh, I think it's an important question, rather than what I have a theory. You know, that theory you said it was about the character of NATO as an organization. Uh, NATO as an organization, it was said earlier, it's not empire. But the fact of the matter is that, particularly during the Cold War, but like you, can see, you had flat out dictatorships which were members of NATO. Dictatorship and you might say aspiring dictatorship. I come from Italy. Italy was a democracy in which the Communist Party was polling at one point something like 35% of the votes. And NATO had a nice little operation in place called Operation Gladio, which would kick in if the Communist Party were to prevail by the total means and basically carry out a military coup to make sure that Italy wouldn't get out of line. Portugal, which was a bloody dictatorship, was a, mem was a member of NATO for a large part of its history. Uh, Greece, uh, Spain, nothing. But I, I think Turkey to this day, which is like, a, if that's a democracy, uh, I'm not sure where to begin, but it's a member of NATO. So I guess what I wanted to point out is that there's such an immense and unbridgeable chasm separating the basic needs and aspirations of ordinary people, citizens of all these countries, and what the ruling class and its political representatives do in their name. That there's no place for any kind of we pronoun in this. That when we say, what can we do, what has NATO done? We haven't done a damn thing. Right? The American people have been embroiled in a series of conflicts, one after another. They have never had the opportunity to say no or to say yes. It just simply happens, and it happens routinely behind their backs, and regardless of what they think and what they want. So NATO is not some, first of all, North Atlantic, you know, just even just basic geographical placement of the organization, North Atlantic, not like Central Europe. And so it's very clear in its history that it has little to do with defense of sort of potentially oppressed people, but it is an instrument of uh, imperialism that's been functioning in that manner since its inception. Just quickly, yeah, I, I, just want to, I think uh, to make your question about why does it seem as a great power politics is that the questions of the 20th century have only been posed. They were never answered. And even if they were answered, they were never I'll be allowed, you know, you, nobody allowed them to be answered fully or in a convincing manner. So I agree with, uh, you know, Professor Alexei, we need to think of new ways to meet these challenges. We may disagree on what those ways might be, but I really think the fact that we are seeing this is precisely because all those issues remain unsettled. Uh, I do not know your name, but your question about uh, Bosnia is a very important one because I think people have tended to forget that you know, I know most people might pretend the Balkans are not part of Europe, but the 1990s were pretty much a decade of absolute destruction, horror, mass killings, wars in, in the former Yugoslavia. The breakup of Yugoslavia is one of the most awful and forgotten chapters of this history, and whether or not one likes it, NATO did play a very significant 
and not a very good role in this process. It's not just Bosnia in 1995 with Dayton. In 1998, NATO was heavily involved in you know, the bombing of Kosovo, a 60-day bombing campaign. Which is what you know, which then led to the independence of Kosovo, which was proclaimed as independent in 2008. So it's a lot lingering question. In, at that point, neither Russia nor China exercised their veto. When NATO carried out its bombing campaign, it was not authorized by the United Nations. So the NATO called it illegal but legitimate. Right? So these so this is a period. So it is, I think, a still lingering question and it's going to have profound effects. So thank you for asking that. Please, really quick. Um, you know, I, I think there's a live argument. Um, a lot of us hold the premise that NATO cannot be seen as an instrument of defense. It's a problem. And this is part of what raises concern about how the you know, U.S. and uh, NATO countries are going to react to uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And you know, let's have pointed out uh, the situation in the 1990s. You can read our article. We can we can autograph it, right? It's called taking the most of it seriously. Um, and so there is this, um, there's a danger of kind of this binary uh, of, Na of um, using NATO as some sort of positive opportunity. And just to wrap up, the um, United States, since the end of the Cold War, has been adamantly opposed to independent European security organization, right? Stated that right in 1992, uh, Pentagon plans. So that remains true. That if the United States insists on basically anchoring uh, contemporary imperialism by using NATO to legitimize <coughs> There were other hands up, so uh, I see three. I'm going to ask all three to ask their questions. If your question is directed at one of the speakers, please make it clear that it is. Right? Go ahead. Uh, my name is Sasha. Uh, this is just a general question for the candidates. So I, I've noticed a difference in the way that this war has been treated. And I know that prior, my family is from Ukraine, and I know that prior to this war, a lot of people didn't even know it was a country. People didn't hear about it. It wasn't in the news. It was very away from um, media. And I've noticed a difference in how this war has been treated because other similar countries and similar wars have been kept quiet and kept away from the public eye. And this one is very public and, and very pronounced. And even the um, the moving of, of refugees has been, I don't know if accepted is the right word, but it's been better than other similar wars in similar countries and similar situations. So is there something, aside from it being a European country, um, is there something different about this war or different about the process or the people that makes it treated differently? So, uh, there is no doubt what Putin is doing is independent, but it's conducted on the public. But your presentation gave me a perception of it clearly stated that this is a war between uh, between stupid, like, idiot, corrupted Putin and democracy. United States already has been saying that India, Pakistan should. Everyone should join the U.S. camp and condemn Russia. And those countries were not condemning Russia, and the United States said that they will have to pay a price. So don't you think this conception that this is a war between democracies and authoritarian Putin, authoritarian regime, implies that everybody who is neutral, anybody who tries to understand the way structural basis of this war, is pro authoritarian regimes and anti democracy. Thank you. So, this question is specifically to Professor Alexei. Okay. Uh, and uh, Maria, oh, right? Okay. Please. Okay. Um, yeah, I thought of uh, two questions one for Dr. Alexei and then one for this kind of general set of the panel. Um, the first one for Dr. Alexei is um, you talk, when discussing what Americans can, can do, you um, focus it on, or can you hear it all right? Very, uh, I miss how you can remove your face okay. yeah. gotcha. if your neighbors don't mind. I'm on it, okay. Um, yeah, so for talking about what Americans do, you kind of focused it on sanctions, and I thought it was interesting how um, in uh, latter presentation, sanctions were talked about um, more in a kind of uh, uh, 
you know, a, a weapon of war in that way. And I was interested in giving the history of sanctions and kind of their effectiveness or lack of effectiveness in Cuba or Iran, for example, and regime change and in promoting peace, kind of how you respond to that and how you would, you know, position, like what sort of sanctions and how you think they might actually be effective in this case. And then um, for my second question, um, I thought looking at Dr. Alexi's presentation and um, you framing NATO as expansive and, um, and in that way, but Dr. Alexi was talking about how uh, kind of in a preemptive rebuttal perhaps looking at that uh, the voluntary nature of joining, um, like how NATO is voluntary, people join <laughs> voluntarily. So it's kind of how with that criticism you would respond to that and given how, um, you know, for countries who were formerly in the Soviet sphere of influence, how it's kind of a rational choice to join NATO, given, um, you know, as, you know, that for protection in that way, um, given the history of those countries being under the Soviet sphere of influence and what that did to them. So, so is this uh, second question directed to a particular speaker? Uh, I'll to Dr. Bayer then I shall. I'll make it. <laughs> 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 or or no. it's all okay. Professor Alexius. So, <laughs> Whatever order you prefer, if you would like to go first, Mihail. Uh, yeah, sure. So, uh, do I go for the questions specifically to me, or uh, yeah, you answer them specifically to you? And if you have something to add on ones that were not specific, you can do that too. Yeah, I. I what was your question? How is this war different in the way that it's been seen in media and in the way that immigrants or refugees have been? I will make a question. No, 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 just a second. Uh, but one thing I will mention about refugees and immigrants. Think of the scale. Five million, actually, 4.8 some million outside Ukraine. Latest figure, seven million displaced within Ukraine. If we project that to the Mexico-US situation, imagine a situation proportionately to the Mexican population that we have something like, you know, 15 million. Mexicans pouring over the borders, not the caravan of 300,000, right? So would that create a heightened media attention? I bet you it would. And so uh, another thing about this war is that for all the other conflicts mentioned, uh, we have not seen one sovereign state attack another sovereign state with a specific purpose to annihilate the very notion of the state and to take the territory. That is different. This is not something, you know, I mean, mentioned we invaded, you know, many states, but we did not uh, deny those states the right to exist. And we invaded it, particularly after the Cold War, you know, things evolved. We can compare things countries did 500 years ago and say, yeah, you know, it's all like that. But if we compare post-Cold War, we invaded against regimes like the Taliban, Saddam Hussein, you know, Muammar uh, Gaddafi, uh, Bashar Assad, you know, we, we did not invade, um, uh, we did not kill democratic countries, which is, which is what Russia is doing. So, so there are differences. But now, to your question, basically the short answer is no, right? Uh, the short answer is no. Um, the, uh, uh, clearly, uh, you know, there is there's certainly a need to understand more right, about the situation. But I think from the perspective of the situation on the ground for what Ukrainians fight, it's very clear for what they fight. They don't want those scenes of butcher to be their daily life. And on my memory, I still remember how Ukrainian identity was extinguished. I lived in the Soviet Ukraine. The blue and yellow flag that you see was banned. If you displayed it, you would be kicked out of the university. If you stop by the monument of the Ukrainian poet, which was kind of a, a, a accepted by the Soviet government because he was also against the Tsarist regime. Uh, but uh, the, they were students recruited, including we were instructed, public order volunteers. There was a total surveillance of everybody on everybody. It was a horrible place to be. So I think the, the collapse of the Soviet Union was actually not the geopolitical tragedy. It, it was, you know, we had geopolitical tragedies like the Holocaust and World War II and World War I and the Great Leap Forward and the Great Terror by Stalin. But, uh, so, you know, if you think of why there is a reluctance in places like India, Brazil, South Africa, 
to join sanctions on Russia. A lot of rhetoric there is that it's neutrality or anti-colonialism, but actually if you look at the real reasons, India imports more than 50% of its weapons from Russia. It buys now oil for cheap from Russia, and it has Russia building a nuclear power plant with six units. So that's why it's that reliable. South Africa is negotiating a $2 billion contract to buy cheap Russian gas. And Brazil depends 25% on Russian fertilizer, and Bolsonaro says fertilizer is everything for Brazil. So behind that rhetoric, there, there, are, there are other issues. Uh, sanctions, huge question. <laughs> And I have an article with Henry Hale where we analyzed the survey data from 2013 and 2014 before and after Crimea, how whether the balance of support that Putin got was in response to sanctions or uh, the actual event, and we found that it was predominantly the event. But, but the literature on the sanctions is huge. Uh, and one interesting point, I would only bring one point here that uh, the, the sanctions are, are unlikely to deter a large, rich, authoritarian state from aggression. Typically, if you look at the old cases of sanctions imposed on one country by another, uh, the sanctions work if they are imposed against a rather weaker democratic state. Ukraine is actually a prime example. Uh, we used our leverage and pressure on Ukraine to have it abandon the world's third largest arsenal of nuclear weapons in 1994. Ukraine being a small, you know, um, not very rich democracy, sanctions kind of the, the, even the idea that Ukraine may be a kind of a rogue state uh, induced the policymakers to give up the nuclear weapons. Uh, and, and so against countries like that it works. Uh, but rich autocracies are very, you know, think of Iran under sanction, think of North Korea under sanctions, huge sanctions for years. The Soviet Union was under massive sanctions. It didn't force it to change its ways. Yeah. So, other than Cuba, yeah. So, let them. Oh, sure. Uh, actually, I wanted to start by saying, Sasha, you said you, uh, you know, thank you for your question uh, that, I, that I hope, you know, I hope your family is safe because what's happening there is a horrific tragedy, right? So in one way, the fact that the world is paying attention to an unfolding tragedy is not a bad thing. But as you rightly said, the fact that it doesn't pay equal attention to all the unfolding tragedies, I mean, there's a war going on in Yemen. Anybody heard about it? I wouldn't blame you if you haven't, because I think there was a, a, a study just now that said Ukraine was featured in mainstream uh, uh, news media, I think 533 times in March alone, and Yemen has been mentioned 91 times in the past two years. So it, it, it is, it is, I think, striking, right? I, I think uh, refugees, this kind of horror, the fact that people have been, I mean, the pictures that you saw here or elsewhere, these are truly horrifying images, and as human beings, we should be moved by them. Uh, when, when these kinds of situations are forced on people, one should hope that the rest of humanity opens up their doors, their borders. It doesn't happen. Right? So I think that we, there are many, many reasons that one can go into that. But I think the question of who counts as the aggressor and where these stories are being told is also important. Right? It's not just a question of who are the victims, who are the aggressors. So that's one, one way to think about it. So. I'm so I'm really glad that your family is doing okay, and I hope they remain safe. So, uh, Maria, your question: rationality is an odd thing, right? Uh, the voluntariness of NATO, what NATO represents, as Professor Alexiev said, this could be books and books, and we can go on. Uh, the question of what it means for various former Soviet republic to seek the benevolent embrace of NATO is uh, uh, it's a rather interesting question. So, rationally speaking. It makes perfect sense for them. Rationally speaking, it might make perfect sense for Russia, you know, if you're using the rationality of international relations language, to say that they do not want an anti-Russia coalition extending right up to their borders. Right? So rationality is a double-edged sword when one thinks about it in those terms. So, I mean, just imagine rationally, given if you're a small country next to a, a giant, powerful neighbor, one who has a massive military, uh, which it has shown consistent desire to use, uh, one that makes its displeasure very obvious, 
you might want military alliances, but I imagine if Mexico ever wanted to make a military pact with Iran or Venezuela or Russia, uh, the rationality may not appeal so much to people, right? So, so when one asks questions about rationality, it's worth broadening one's mind. Generally, you know, just to keep it just a thought. Uh, I want to add here, please. It is a poignant dilemma about uh, yeah, these countries that uh, certainly, I, mean, I think there's popular support for joining NATO. Um, this book, you know, the, the, the efforts of Eastern and Western Europeans to unite against both, both the U.S. and Soviet Union, it dealt with these tensions. Uh, the East Europeans would sometimes tell the West Europeans, yeah, but you don't know what's it's like being under you know, authoritarian communist regimes. And you know, the West Europeans said, no, you know, you know, help us know what it's like. We do want to know what it's like, but we want to think about this broader vision. This gets back to what we can do. We can certainly respect, uh, have empathy for the, the reason to you know be under the NATO umbrella. But you know what we can do is have this broader common conversation about what are the consequences and what kind of world do we want. And then it gets to uh, your question about can we get past whether we call it balance of power politics or just imperialist politics. But it is a real dilemma you point out that is worth all of us thinking about. So I have a question um, to all of you. Was this war preventable, right? And I'm talking in the short term. In the short term, United States intelligence, we are told, was excellent in predicting that Russia was preparing a day, right? Okay. So in the short term, in the lead up to the war, was the United States in a position to help prevent this war from coming, from happening? And if so, what would it have taken? I know it's speculative. So maybe just in a month before. I'm talking in the you know maybe months, but well, don't stretch it into decades. Okay, right? Right. So, like in, in November, I think the United States started releasing intelligence on on Russian intentions. So, I mean, do you mean since then? I mean, use months as your measure, not years and decades. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. You remember the day when the dawn of time happened? Could yeah. we have prevented all wars? So, if anybody wants to approach this, I. <laughs> I, I can answer, but I always started, so maybe this time I may yeah. ask for yeah. you guys. Start yeah. Now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I, it seems to me that this war is an absolute boom for the American people. Uh, I think Biden has explained and stated that they were already fun with weapons in Ukraine before the war started. I think this is part of it. And, and, and what I was trying to kind of introduce earlier about the question of democracy in this country, this is, this is a, uh, it's not boom, but it's certainly a very corrupt and crisis ridden government, which is kind of uh, staggered from one political crisis to the next uh, with the basic norms of democracy in this country being a very, very substantial. A government that does the things I listed in my presentation is, would be very thrilled to be able to deflect its own political responsibilities at home toward the usual obtained enemy abroad. It would be very thrilled to kind of uh, subsume the demands that its population might have for uh, essential social services and education and healthcare and all these things, to kind of instead be able to say, no, we need even more money for the Pentagon. And uh, so in other words, I, I don't think that the American government has the slightest interest in preventing this war. That's not what I asked. Right? That's not the question. That's not the question. The question, the question, the question is, who could it have? Could it have? Could it have? Could it have? Why not the like it itself? Have. Well, that's, 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 that's a fair question. Okay, could it have, the, the thing is, right, could it have, in the abstract, if it were a different kind of regime, since we like using regime, yes, like, is, was this a preventable war? I mean, I know Professor Lexi and I have this conversation in our corridors all the time. Um, look, there are multiple factors that lead to these wars, right, and some of the sites that we have been subjected to, I mean, one doesn't know, uh, like, the exact thing that goes in people's heads as they make decisions to invade other countries, right? Some of the, so that part is the incalculable part that's the wild card, so to speak. 
but if given all the other conditions, knowing what was at stake, knowing the fact that, you know, the, a country might be destroyed in the war, uh, could they have, did they know enough to make all kinds of gestures to prevent it, including calling for an open summit hosted by DC or something of that sort? Could they have done it? In the abstract, in a different world, sure. But I think the Emanuele's answer is actually an answer because given the current situation, given the type of government that we have here, given its own specific sort of uh, uh, imperatives to hold on to power, it preferred to see this fall out in certain way. They may not have predicted exactly the thing, but the fact of the matter is that every other thing that they wanted. The Pentagon has an estimated budget of 7.3 trillion over the next decade. Now this is going to increase even more. Um, the $813 billion proposed budget, you actually have a bipartisan group of Congress people writing to the president saying, no, 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 you need to adjust it for inflation. Let's make it $100 billion more. Right? So these are all things that they seem to have bipartisan consensus on. So could and should sort of merge in a certain way. So in the abstract, was this preventable? Absolutely. But would it have given what we have? I, I don't think so. I mean, and, and, that, and that has as much to do with the nature of the US state as it does of the Russian state. So. Anyone else want to? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Perhaps I'll give the more, I don't know, um, moderate answer is that, uh, I, I think it's a really good question for me, is that, um, look, I, I think there's splits even within U.S. policy makers, and so uh, at some point, you know, hopefully um, the call for militarism will decline within the United States, and maybe within sort of a lean perspective that, doesn't, that still doesn't change kind of the fundamentals of how U.S. security and military policy works. If this kind of thing, okay, how can we bring this to a halt? I mean, we saw some of this back in the Balkans in the 1990s where eventually the United States got more cooperative. I mean, still without surrendering kind of their sphere of influence. There, I, I guess the maddening thing is it did seem like if the U.S. was serious about um, you know, bringing a diplomatic settlement. I mean, we actually know the terms. It's sort of like Israel, Palestine, and Peru and I discussed, is that for a long time we knew the terms of Israel withdraws from all the occupied territories. Um, some kind of deal is made about refugees. Um, you do some kind of international uh, you know, peacekeeping. We knew the deal then, that was the global consensus, but of course Israel uh, was blocked by the United States, so protected Israel from blocking. And here too, we know what would work. I mean, something about taking NATO off the table, neutrality, and getting, say, US, China, other, you know, it's a, a big summit. Um, so, so the conditions are there, some kind of creative autonomy for the parts of, you know, eastern parts of the Ukraine, something that Crimea up and so. I'm going to perhaps, part of me thinks maybe at some point the less dangerous elements of um, kind of the military security apparatus of the United States will gain some influence. Sort of, if one looks at post-World War II history, the, the best moments is when kind of the saner elements have uh, temporarily had power. It still isn't taking care of the fundamental issues, but, but I think it's The Democratic Party attack consistently the Trump administration from the White House. Oh, not the Democratic Party, but let's say someone like a Chaz Freeman, right? So, like uh, these past diplomats that actually can be quite critical of uh, the U.S. military intervention. And so, you start to think about, I mean, right now, it's not in the cards. I'm not saying it's in the cards right now. But I, I think it's worth thinking about what would it look like, a, um, something that wouldn't call for a fundamental transformation that would still lead to some of these resolutions. Well, I, well, just more specifically to the conflict, uh, speaking about the conflict, and basically if you have a conflict of interest, uh, it's either bargaining of the terms, the 
So uh, bargaining was tried. In fact, uh, when uh, Russia first amassed over 100,000 troops on the borders with Ukraine in March and April 2021, if you remember, Biden called Putin, and they did have a summit. Well, I think Walter, you mentioned, why not have a summit? Well, they did have a summit. And uh, it didn't, um, you know, and Biden offered, you know, he said, we want to make a relationship stable and predictable. Uh, we want to have open channels of communication, you know, we, we want to keep negotiating and we keep going forward. Ha, <laughs> Putin, there was, I, I think the BBC correspondent in, Mos in Moscow was absolutely on target when he said, well, this is a non-starter for Putin. Putin's whole career is to, this, to, to keep people unstable and unpredictable, not stable and predictable. But anyway, so that was tried. There were massive efforts. We haven't even, even had a CIA chief fly to Moscow to try to kind of create things. We, we offered all kinds of concessions on uh, military deployments so that Russia would not be threatened. And in my view, actually, um, it was bordering kind of on appeasement because if you, if you looked at the data that I showed you in the presentation, the story of NATO enlargement in Europe is not the story of surrounding Russia, of being anti-Russian. The story is how not to provoke Russia, from making sure that Ukraine doesn't have nuclear weapons, to reducing the number of US troops tenfold. The first thing that Biden did when he came to power in 2020, he pulled out 12,000 troops from, from US troops from Europe. Right? What did Putin do? Putin put more. So if we if we think empirically on what could stop what could have stopped Putin, Putin by the way was the big actor. Zelensky was elected on a platform of making peace with Russia. He was adamant and, and I remember in the Ukrainian opinion polls at the time uh, negotiating peace was like the number one priority when Zelensky got to power. And so he said, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I just want to talk. I'm going to discuss. We, we are going to agree on something, you know. And Putin just wouldn't see him. He wouldn't pick up the phone, you know. And, and he insisted on basically uh, Ukraine accepting those two uh, Russia-supported statements in East Ukraine and giving them the veto power over not just NATO, but broader Ukrainian foreign and domestic policy. So he wanted Russia to have basically a legal power over what Ukraine does. So these things couldn't, couldn't do. So then that, that leaves us pretty much with deterrence. Could have deterrence worked? Well, I have like six or seven observations on what Putin did when the West threatened or used military force uh, to show intent, to, to show resolve. The, the, the biggest case in point is Georgia, 2008. The Russian tanks are 20 miles from Tbilisi, and then they stop. Well, what happens? Well, uh, what happens is that we direct two warships, just two warships, not, not even a huge ones, from the Malta in the Mediterranean to the Black Sea. And uh, there's a report, leaked documents from the National Security Council, that the option of striking Russian forces in the tunnel, crossing into Georgia, those invading Russian forces, was on the table, right? Just on the table, not even like something considered. In reality, it was not even considered, right? So, Putin stops. Some week or so later, I watched him live on Russian television, and he went absolutely angry. And he said, why? And he was asked, why didn't you like, go and capture Tbilisi and do away with this fascist Saakashvili? Because all Putin's enemies are fascists. You know? yeah. so, and he says, well, do you know that we have those US warships coming into the Black Sea? And, and there are a lot of other examples of that. So I, I looked at examples where some force was used or threatened against Putin, was not threatened against Putin. He never stopped. So, yeah. yeah. I'm basically saying that what we did instead, we, we said something that I think is actually dangerous, not only with respect to the Ukraine war, but to the future. Because we made two statements, and, and Biden repeated them several times, that, that, that alarmed me a lot. As somebody who studied deterrence and nuclear posturing, Cold War, etc. Uh, in one speech, Biden would say two things. He would say, 
we will never, we, we, we have no intent to fight Russia. And then in the other sentence he would say, we will defend every inch of NATO territory. What kind of message is it? So, first of all, it means Russia has a green light to attack any territory that is not part of NATO. Uh, and it also sends a message that we are not even going to threaten him. But we will defend, the, to, pay attention to the word defend every inch of NATO territory. If you have to defend it, it's too late. It means the war already begin. it's dangerous. Uh, uh, analysis and models of the Cold War. I actually had this exercise in my class if you play the game of chicken. Uh, two drivers are heading to each other. Uh, if in a normal game of chicken, like I had a poll in class, 80% of students say they would swerve because they are afraid the other person may actually have the intent to go straight at them. And then I had another experimental question. I, I asked, well, what if you know for sure that the other person is going to swerve? What are you going to do? Are you going to swerve or are you going to go straight? Oh, straight. It's 80% go straight. So that's Putin for you. We clearly send the signal to Putin that we're going to swerve. So he's going to he's going straight and keeps capturing. Could the war could stop? Yes, it could have. If we, if we applied uh, posturing, if we applied uh, signaling, uh, unfortunately, <coughs> unfortunately, we had to go back to the bad old cold war days to do, but it wasn't our choice. If others want yes, to comment so on that. Uh, make a point. Again, I think here addressing a historical perspective is crucial, because I find it very difficult to swallow the notion that the Biden administration did, was doing what he could to avoid this and to ramp down the conflict. If we go back to the history of American imperialism, for example, in the Kosovo War, then you come to learn that the so-called attempts to de-escalate the conflict carried out by American diplomacy he took the form of something called the Rangouye Agreement, which was a proposal not only to allow 30,000 NATO troops to quote police Kosovo, but also allowed NATO troops in the Serbia, which was practically a, a, a proposal that was calculated so that Nerosi would have to pass it. Lest we forget also that the always benevolent and always ever reluctant American government and military also sold its own population of a pack of lies in the lead up to the Iraq war, going to the United Nations and just lying through their teeth about weapons of mass destruction. So it strikes me as if every conflict there's a generalized sort of amnesia about all this history, which then turns, of course, into a very convenient uh, generalized political amnesty for all the things that American imperialism and how you carry it. And I must say that, that if, you, if you just look at the record of its so-called attempts to de-escalate and, and kind of pull down away from the precipice of the conflict, these are uh, pathetic. Not only pathetic, but this is a way to ensure that, 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 uh, that the other party would have no, no uh, opportunity to pull back, even if they had the inclination to do it. Saddam Hussein was desperate to avoid like he, he would have taken any number of deals, but of course you can't go forward. There are certain things like the entire kind of surrendering of the sovereignty of the nation you cannot afford that, as NATO did to serve in in Armenia. So I think we have to be a little bit more kind of not forgetful about the lessons of the past and not be prepared to buy into the very prevalent narrative that the United States is always reluctant and always seeking for a peaceful resolution to it. Uh, are there any questions or comments anybody wants to raise? Yes, please. So, yeah, in the videos, uh, there was, oh. Louder. Yeah, okay. So, in the video, uh, and also actually the professor that was talking from Ukraine, he mentioned, he's like, we, we believe that we Ukrainians do not deserve this. And then there was also, you know, uh, some information from a, a intelligence from the U.S. that was trying to, uh, to be passed on uh, to the to Ukraine that they kind of disregard. So my question would be a little bit, you know, uh, parallel with your previous question. What was the trigger that started the invasion, and what can be done to stop it? 
So it's an invitation to continue to mull over this question yeah, in terms of a trigger. Um, yeah. For those who want to mull over it and say more about it, that's an opportunity. Is there, is there an additional question so that the speakers can mull over it or comment? And this will be, use this mulling also as your final statement. How about that? Okay. Whoever wants to start, just feel free. Why don't you guys start? Because I have to leave, I have a meeting at three. Please. Um, yeah. So, uh, Maybe like one minute each. Yeah, yeah, I think that's it. Look, I, I, I do think, you know, for me to question, it is good. We, we should think about what would the terms look like? Um, and maybe that the U.S. will never go long, maybe at some point it will, but it's still worthwhile to think. We actually do have kind of terms there that the U.S. has, has blocked repeatedly. Um, in some ways, Zelensky is actually closer to it, so that's, that's another poignant thing, is that Zelensky is a little bit closer than anyone else to it, but neither the U.S. nor the Russia are, are interested right now in that deal. And here we should be most concerned about the U.S., but let's think about the terms. I mean, the, ter the terms are still not complicated. Neutrality, uh, NATO off the table, some kind of autonom autonomy deal for the statements. Um, so we shouldn't, we shouldn't lose sight that there is at least an immediate uh, way out. We won't deal with the long-term problems, but we would deal with this. Yeah, I, I, I just want to say I, I absolutely agree with what Professor said about the Ukrainian people do not deserve this kind of horror. Neither do most of the people who suffer under the yoke of any kind of horror oppression. So that is something we really need to think about. And the question you asked is the biggest question of them all. And I think as part of the panel, you heard us talk about what's happening right now, like immediate triggering events, but also sort of historical contextual events that allow us to make sense of the immediate triggers. So it's a larger question and only by understanding sort of the dialectic between the bigger picture and what has happened immediately, we can make sense of what's going on. So thank you for your question. Yeah, just, uh, I guess, um, to me, the if the question at the end of the day is we're looking for what needs to be done, what needs to be done is that um, I think in the immediate the, the, there has to be a way to organize and stimulate the appearance of an anti-war movement in this country as well as If you're looking for the existing government, an anti-war, an anti-war, we didn't hear it, can you say it again? An anti-war movement, an anti-war movement is, I think, the way forward, because even if this situation in Ukraine were to be magically solved, I don't, the point is exactly that the existing authorities in play, whether it's the Biden, or the Ukrainian or the Russian governments, I fundamentally do not believe that these entities in any meaningful sense represent the basic needs and aspirations of working people in Russia, in Ukraine, and in the United States who do not want war, who have no interest and have never been asked to do any of this, and yet they're the one who pay the price for that. I think we don't have to go back to the Vietnam era right? in 2000. On, on the eve of the Iraq conflict, there were millions of people in the streets uh, of every major city, certainly in Europe and also in this country as well. And I think that the responsible political orientation that young people should have is not to offer to the existing arsonists some clever little kind of, uh, some, some sort of plan that they might consider, but to actually like build an anti-war movement that would just categorically say no to these people and, and, and what they're doing. And, and I think there's, you know, the, the problem is the, the, the political establishment in this country, as well as in other countries, is entirely rigged against it. What passes for the left in this country um, has been, uh, in, if anything, more pro-war and vociferously inclined to confront the so-called dangers on the geopolitical arena than the right wing. And that's yet another demonstration of the fact that working people in this country are fundamentally disenfranchised. That the Democratic Party doesn't don't represent them, and the Republican parties sure as hell don't represent them. And I'm afraid that this is a difficult task to be taken on. But there's an immediate the immediate trigger here would be the fact that these arsonists are threatening your life and your possible futures. And someone needs to put an end to it. And it's not gonna be 
some sort of clever plan and some uh, artful diplomacy that's going to bring this to an end. The very last point, this is a period that's very much reminiscent of the lead up, lead up to World War I. Even if you solve the question in Ukraine, like the, the structural sort of, it's very clear that everything is in place, whether the trigger rent is going to be Ukraine or something over the South China Sea or Taiwan or Iran, everything is arranged in a certain manner that like the, the coming world conflict is, is, is very predictable. And who's going to stop? It's not going to be this government, and it's not going to be the other government. So thank you. Okay. Well, I will just say uh, one. Uh, the, uh, uh, well, I I want to draw your attention to the fact that it occurred to me how lucky we are here. You know, if I were you, when I was your age, and I was at the key of university, we could not have this. If we had speakers like you guys who said the Soviet government is imperialist and oppressive and da da da, they would have been already in Siberia and the salt mine. It's so wonderful that we can criticize, you know, uh, our own government, that we can criticize the structure or the leadership or whatever. And that's what Ukraine is fighting for. They want to be able, like you, to sit in this room like this and discuss their future, their ideas. An anti-war movement would help them if it were in Russia. But unfortunately, in Russia today, not only you are not allowed to organize a movement, but even calling what is going on an invasion or a war is now uh, made, gets you to jail for 15 years. Objecting to Crimea annexation gets you to jail for five years. So if we could organize an anti-war movement in Russia that would uh, overthrow Putin, the Putin regime, then the war would end. But that is highly unlikely, and I would say impossible. The polling data suggests, even with list experiments, uh, to identify the kind of true preferences of respondents, the estimate, my estimate, is about 65-70% support the war and support Putin. Uh, in addition to the media propaganda, uh, with all the false narratives that I mentioned and other things, you know, there's also what they call totalitarian convergence. People don't have an alternative source of information, and they kind of express support because they think others have no choice to express anything but that support item. So I hope we understand that. And unfortunately, right now, the best form to give this movement a rise to save lives in Ukraine is military assistance to Ukraine. That, the military assistance right now to Ukraine is the best form of humanitarian assistance to Ukraine and the best form to speed up negotiations, to speed up the peace process, and to end what is going on. So thank you guys very much. So thank you all for coming.